And my Lords, we've liaised over the lunchtime adjournment, so I hope we can make good use of the time. And I'm conscious of some points that are going to be taken by Ms. Martin and Mr. Webster, which I can deal with briefly because we're at Eden on this. So I'm going to deal with four brief points. Firstly, I'm going to return to the test issue and the relevance of reasonableness in respect of Article 3 and the systems duty and pick up some questions that were asked on my piece <coughs> earlier. Secondly, I'm going to deal briefly with the issue about Article 6. Uh, third, I'm going to deal briefly with the issue about the European Convention being interpreted in harmony with other rules of international law and where that gets us in this case. Mr. Webster, I know, is going to deal with that in some more detail, so I can take a short look. <coughs> and then fourthly, very briefly, I'm going to turn to remedy. So first, on the relevance of reasonableness and the test, the issue here, first of all, is in our skeleton, I made reference to paragraph 33, You'll see how we put it at paragraphs 22 and 37, my lords, of the skeleton. So in paragraphs 22 and 37 of the skeleton, we refer uh, to the systems duty requiring the UK to put in place systems, precautions and procedures, so both the framework and the means of enforcement of the framework, which will, and we use the phrase, to the greatest extent practicable. We're conscious, my lord, that you asked the question about possible. And uh, greatest extent possible is not the appropriate test. It is practicable, as reflected in paragraph 37 and 22 of our submission. And my apologies to those who sit behind me for not spotting. So that's a, that a phrase used in the authorities? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to take you to the phrase in the authorities. And indeed, it also goes to this point about reasonableness, because we don't shy away from accepting that there is, that reasonableness is part of this test. The issue is that we disagree on what reasonableness means in this context. So first of all, could I ask you to look at Middleton, the first authority, Bundle, Bundle 1, Volume 1, page 14. The phrase used by Lord Bingham. Reasonably practicable. Yes, reasonably this says reasonably practicable. to the greatest extent reasonably practicable. That's the phrase used. And to the greatest extent reasonably practicable is a phrase used in a number of the cases. And my lords, we don't think that dis that differs from the approach which we were taking, recognising that reasonableness applies. And we think that that's a useful shorthand. So paragraph two describes there how in respect of Article 2, but it also applies to Article 3. Uh, Article 2, right to life, imposes on member states an obligation to establish a framework of laws, precautions, procedures, and means of enforcement, which will, to the greatest extent reasonably practicable, protect life. So how is it <coughs> reasonably practicable to completely rewrite the DPA? Now, my Lord, I, I think we're again back to the ships passing in the night uh, issue because our position is the, que the question as put of is it reasonable not to uh, comply is quite different to the question in the way that we frame it. Because here, it, it's not whether it's reasonable not to comply with what Article 3 would otherwise require and what we say Article 3 does require in these circumstances. It's simply that there's an incompatibility. And ultimately, our position is that this is a matter which is an irreconcilable clash between the Vienna Convention, Articles 31 and 37, and what Article 3 requires. Well, I mean, I'm just going to put it to you one more time, because if, the, if Article 3 requires you to have systemic provisions in force to the greatest extent reasonably practicable and if it is not reasonably practicable to have provisions in force for the children of diplomats why is that a function of asking the wrong question uh, so my lord the question is what reasonably practicable to the greatest extent reasonably practicable means because in essence what the divisional court did uh, and what my lord uh, also underlies your question 
it is to suggest that I'm, I'm just asking why you say that the DPA doesn't matter and it's got nothing to do with this test when it's a part of the UK's obligation yeah, but similarly my lord so this is the way that we put it in our skeleton was to say um, at paragraph 64 that the divisional court fell into error in expanding the application of the standard of reasonableness which boundaries the positive obligations arising under article 3 uh, to include steps which are practically achievable and available but are excluded by an interpretation about the principle of international law in circumstances where there's conflicting principles of international law and this is the nub of the case or the $64,000 question as I put it earlier uh, because here we're not dealing with a situation where it concerns for example unpredictability of human conduct or limitations of resources <coughs> it's a different point and that's why when we go back to the cases and we look at what the test is under article 3 uh, our position and the local authorities position is that the test under article 3 is whether the system is effective now Middleton refers uh, to there needing to be a framework of laws precautions procedures and means of enforcement which will to the greatest extent reasonably practicable protect life and uh, we also see that if we look at the Sodexo case which is in bundle 2 tab 11 page 574 a decision of Mr Justice Julian Knowles in the High Court and if you look at paragraph 41 again the reference is made to reasonably practicable there's a positive obligation inherent in Articles 3 and 8 to ensure so far as reasonably practicable that individuals are protected from cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, Article 3. And then there's that quote underneath it in paragraph 42 from the Z case, which refers to, as we cited earlier at paragraph 73, the importance of positive measures, measures taken under Article 3, providing effective protection in particular of children and other vulnerable persons, including reasonable steps to prevent ill treatment of which the authorities had or ought to have knowledge. And we then see over the page a paragraph, the end of paragraph 43, there's a quote from Lord Reed in the T case. And at the very end it says, the court developed the concept of the positive obligation precisely to express the principle that the state cannot fulfil its duty under Article 1 of the Convention to secure the rights guaranteed by simply remaining passive. And then paragraph 46 refers to the positive obligation to ensure effective prevention of the risk of breaches of Article 3, requiring both an appropriate legislative and administrative framework and mechanisms to ensure that such provisions are effectively <coughs> implemented. Uh, it also cites a paragraph 47 the Sweden case, Essen Sweden, which we get at tab 29 of the authorities bundle. In tab 29, again, we look at the issue about the importance of effective protection requiring both a framework and means of enforcement. Sorry, I didn't get the page number. It starts at page 1398 in the electronic bundle. It's a volume D, tab 29, for those using the hard copy. Mm -hmm. And it's paragraph 80 in particular, <coughs> uh, my lord. Page 1418 of the bundle. And it's a duty to maintain and apply in practice an adequate legal framework affording protection against acts of violence by private individuals. Now, the Secretary of State in the skeleton, for bundle 137, paragraph 17.3, refers, in line with this line of authorities, 
the importance of not having lip service only. So it's not only a framework, it's also a means of enforcement of that framework. And that, of course, is in line with long-standing principle from the European Court of Human Rights since 1979 in the Airy case about the importance of ensuring that rights are practical and effective, not theoretical and illusory. The situation we have here is that an entire category of children, thousands of them, of whom AG is one, is simply excluded from that scheme. And our core submission is there is no system of effective protection for that category of child of which AG is indicative. And adopting an approach which says it, it must not be reasonably practicable to even consider whether there's a clash between Article 3's requirements and the Vienna Convention in circumstances where the Vienna Convention's objects and purpose are fundamentally different, not focused on individual rights, but focused on interactions between states. It is, in our view, a stretch of the concept of reasonableness, uh, which is not acceptable. And that's why the way we've put it is, the question here is not whether there's a reasonableness to the restrictions on what could be done, or whether it's simply because there was an incompatibility uh, given the current state of international law and the current state of the exception regarding genuine emergency. Now, the second point I want to turn to quickly relates to Article 6. And in respect of Article 6, I was asked some questions about this earlier on my feet, about why it's not an Article 6 issue rather than an Article 3 issue. And this is an Article 3 issue in our submission, because it's not about the determination of the civil rights and obligations of AG or other children in this category. It's about whether the state can take steps to ensure there are effective measures of protection for children at risk of harm in these circumstances. So it's quite a different situation. And we say it's an Article 3 issue, not an Article 6 issue. And I won't turn it up, but in Z in the UK, for example, the local authority knew about the harm, but didn't take available steps to it to prevent that harm, i.e. applying to a court. Although there's the option of applying to the court, which in that case wasn't taken because of flawed individualised decision making, in our case wasn't taken because of what we say is a macro error, a systems failure, it's an Article 3 issue, not an Article 6 issue. Just as is in Z and the UK, it was an Article 3 issue, not an Article 6 issue. And what we have in this scenario is that all compulsory steps are prevented. The authorities cannot compel assessment through a child assessment order under section 43, which they could with any other child in the jurisdiction. They cannot remove and empower a local authority with parental responsibility. They cannot obtain an emergency protection order under section 44. They cannot obtain an interim care order under section 38. They cannot obtain a care order under section 31. These are all mechanisms which are carefully considered by courts, readily available in other <coughs> contexts, and not available here. And it all goes back to this being a situation in which there simply is no system of effective protection in breach, we say, of Article 3, and a result of what we say is the irreconcilable clash. Now, when this matter came in a different guise before two family courts, a first instance in the cases you've been provided with this morning, the view was, well, there must be a way of reading in or reading down. There's bound to be an exception to cover this kind of scenario. So two family court judges taking the view uh, that there must be a carve out. Now the view we've all taken, and we're unanimous on this, uh, and there was no disagreement in the court below, is that there isn't a way of reading in or reading down. Uh, but the underlying premise of those two first instance decisions, which is surely when you're dealing with abuse of children, there must be a way to make this work, is a similar underlying principle uh, to the one that brings us before the court today. Now, third point I want to deal with very briefly, mindful that Mr. Webster is going to deal with this in some more detail. Uh, we deal in our skeleton at paragraphs 
59 to 63 with the de Meer principle, the principle that the European Convention should be interpreted so far as possible in harmony with other rules of international law. And the Divisional Court's approach to this topic was very odd because the Divisional Court said the de Meer principle is a basis for concluding that the VCDR trumps any other concerns. And it asserted that it's not at all clear that the European Court of Human Rights would accept that Article 3, read together with Article 1, provisions of the UNCRC and the other underlying international materials. Where are you reading from in uh, the Divisional Court judgment? Uh, uh, so I'm just referring, this is referring to paragraph 60 of my skeleton. The references in the judgment. Okay, fine. Sorry. Of course. The references in the judgment, it's paragraph 101, 105, 107, 116, 124, and 25 in particular. And we've summarized it in paragraph 59 of our skeleton. I'm sorry not to turn it off, my lord, I'm just be mindful of the time. Uh, but that's where the court uh, relied on a number of factors to support its conclusion that the ECHR must be read in accordance with the VCDR. And it's where they referred, for example, to the natural meaning of Article 3 ECHR, the textual analysis which they conducted, which we say is flawed. It's where they said that the European Court of Human Rights would confirm its jurisprudence required no breach of the VCDR adopt, adopted almost universally. It would recognise the limits of a regional human rights convention in achieving all that might be desirable. And that analysis, we say, simply does not stand up to scrutiny in context of the widespread recognition of the importance of protection of freedom from torture and the nature of Article 3 within the convention system. There are simply assertions uh, and speculation regarding how Strasbourg would approach this, which are unsupported. And I know Mr. Webster is going to take you to how Strasbourg approaches a clash between two international conventions and some of the cases. And you've seen in our skeleton of paragraph 61. Is he going to deal with Al Adsani? I think he's going to deal with it. You've seen what we say about Al, -Al, -Al Adsani there um, in paragraph 61 and 62 of our skeleton. In essence, Al Adsani says uh, that the convention should, so far as possible, be interpreted in harmony with other rules of international law. If you look at that from the other end of the telescope, we get to the position we and the local authority adopt. Uh, and we also, in our skeleton, deal with the fact that VCD or global ECH or regional is simply not an appropriate approach to take. Here we're dealing with two provisions incorporated into domestic law by the Human Rights Act and by the DPA. The Human Rights Act includes a mechanism whereby the court can make a declaration of incompatibility when there's an incompatibility between another provision of primary legislation and the Human Rights Act. And in our submission, this is precisely such a circumstance. And the Divisional Court's way around that was to claim there was effective protection here when there wasn't. There is no effective protection. It is an irreconcilable conflict. Mr Justice Mostyn was right when he said that in early 2020. The court should recognise that and it should then fall to the legislature to consider what to do about incompatibility. And just finally, on that point about relief, Our position is that the first section 2.1 of the DPA and the impugned articles of the VCDR are incompatible with the Article 3 systems duty and indeed Article 1. They're incompatible with AG's rights under Article 1 and Article 3. There was a very practical ramification for that in 2020 which left her without the protection to which she would have been entitled if she had any other status in this country rather than being a child of a diplomat. It is not possible to have an ECHR compliant interpretation of the relevant provisions of the DPA. That's where we agree with the Divisional Court and disagree with those first instance judgments. And indeed, that's common ground between all of us. It's not possible to read in or read down in a way which renders the statutory scheme convention compliant. It's open to you to make a declaration of incompatibility under Section 4.2, and we invite you to do so. And on that issue, and I'll finish on this, 
insofar as the divisional court considered what it termed the fourth stage, when you're looking at whether a declaration should be made, they made some obiter remarks regarding what they would have done in the hypothetical circumstances that they had agreed with the local authority and with my client below. And that reasoning should not be followed. There's a criticism made that somehow we haven't sought permission to appeal at that, but there are obiter remarks and we don't need to have a specific ground of appeal relating to that. It's been clear throughout that we're seeking a declaration of incompatibility. And contrary to the reasoning of the Divisional Court, we make three key points. First, the remedy of a declaration of incompatibility has an intrinsic value in recognising and identifying the incompatibility or the irreconcilable clash in question. It's a carefully crafted provision in the Human Rights Act. It's not a strike down provision like in the US or the Irish courts. It's a way of indicating that there's an incompatibility here which results in a lack of effective protection for this category of vulnerable child. It then, the baton then passes to Parliament and the executive to consider an appropriate response. And it would have a range of options open to it. And that's why in answer to your question earlier, I was a little cautious because an obvious option uh, might be to simply extend the same scheme, but there could be different ways of dealing with that. It would also be possible for them to take the kind of steps that the majority in the Rees case referred to in 2017 in respect of trafficking, <coughs> about, uh, attempting to raise a concern about this at international level. There would be a range of options open to them. But what is done about <coughs> this clash is not for you. The issue for you is whether or not there is an irreconcilable clash, whether Mr Justice Mostyn was right or whether the Divisional Court was right. And our analysis is that Mr Justice Mostyn was right, and the analysis of paragraphs 94 to 98 in particular is flawed. And third, in the event that no declaration is made, it seems to us there's no proper basis for the suggestion that the International Law Commission will be likely to take up the issue. And for those reasons, uh, we submit that the appeal should be allowed and the relief sought should be granted. Unless I can assist further. Thank you very much, Ms. Gannahan. Yes. My Lords, I'm conscious of the time, so um, I am going to try and deal with the issues that we wish to flag briefly. And as you've already heard, my learned junior, Mr. Webster, is going to deal with particularly why we support all of the submissions made that paragraphs 94 through to 98 were flawed, in particular the approach of the Divisional Court to, in paragraph 98 to what Strasbourg may or may not have done on the clash of these two conventions. Could you, could you just explain very briefly why it's left to uh, AG to bring the appeal? I, there were discussions at a very senior level as to whether or not um, this arm of the state should bring a further appeal after the decision, if, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, the local authority is, of course, an arm of the state, uh, and there were discussions with AG's team, and it was felt that AG very clearly wanted to bring the appeal, felt very keenly, and therefore that it was a decision that they would lead the appeal. Right. And, and may, may, I, may I just make one reference without um, causing any difficulty in terms of um, privilege? Uh, you'll be aware from the papers uh, that my client did not have legal aid below. She no, was I'm represented below but pro bono. Uh, and in fact, she does now have legal aid. There were steps taken. And uh, we and the local authority have been in liaison from an early stage uh, after the handdown of the judgment about the appropriate course. And indeed, we've continued to be in liaison about the appropriate way of presenting the appeal. She does have legal aid. She does have legal aid now. But she did not have it below. So she was uh, party below, uh, but without legal aid. No, I mean, the, the real reason I was asking Ms. Markham about that was that um, you're supporting it, so I'm not quite sure whether it makes much difference whether you're bringing the appeal or just supporting it. Um, but uh, in relief terms, um, you're the person asking for the relief. Um, AG's never asked for any relief. So I'm just, I'm just questioning, really, whether that has any effect on anything, and if not, I'll go... Well, um, my lord, of course, we would, we would um, make the submission it shouldn't, ought not to have, um, because um, the case arises from a time and comes from a time 
when relief would have assisted AG, when she was a 14-year-old asking for the protection of the state. And so it's an appeal arising from the first instance decision of Mr Justice Moskin that there was no jurisdiction. Um, and then a declaration followed on from that decision. So I would put it in that way, if I may, my Lord. Right, thank you. Um, so there are two points, we say, that, that need to be considered in this uh, appeal. And we, of course, adopt and support all of the submissions made on behalf of AG. It's what does Article 3 require of the UK? And I'm going to just take you to that in one moment. And then how those obligations can be reconciled, if at all, with competing obligations under international law to afford immunity. And so, my Lord, that particular point is where we say um, the Secretary of State is wrong to simply come to the point which we say they do, that effectively, because of their positive obligations and their positive ob obligations under the DA and the Vienna Convention, that we don't need to do anything in respect of Article 3 for children diplomats. That, we say, is no answer to the obligations imposed on this state by Article 3. And my Lord, I'm going to just take you through, um, because you asked earlier, just clarification as to what the systems are in place, what they can do, and what we can't do, if that assists. So the starting point, my Lord, is, I would say, the headnote of ZNUK, which is tab 20, electronic bundle 975. very briefly when you were taken to the Middleton case. But this is an important decision because this is a decision where it was held for different reasons that um, the state had failed to comply with Article 3. And it sets out very clearly that um, the measure should provide effective protection in particular of children and other vulnerable persons and include reasonable steps to prevent ill treatment of which the authorities had or ought to have had knowledge. And my Lords, then just looking at very briefly the Sweden case at tab 291418. We've seen all these formulations. You, you have, my Lord, and I'm just pointing to one particular, you haven't looked at this paragraph, it's one particular sentence, if I may. 1498. 1418. Sorry. Tab 29, paragraph <coughs> 81. It's the last sentence of that. Such measures must be, such measures must be aimed at ensuring respect for human dignity and protecting the best interests of the child. Yeah. So well, I'm going to take you briefly to the annex to our skeleton argument, electronic page. But you know, before I go there, I will go to stay in the that bundle, 2285 of the authorities bundle, tab 46. This is the Children Act 2004. It's arrangements to safeguard and promote welfare. It sets out who the section applies to, each of the following, including the local authority and other arms of the state, including the police, NHS. Paragraph, subsection two of that is each person and body to whom this section applies must make arrangements for ensuring that A, their functions are discharged having regard to the need to safeguard and promote the welfare of children, and any services provided by any person pursuant to arrangements made by the person or body in discharge of the functions are provided having regard to that. And at subsection four, each person and body to whom this section applies must, in discharging their duty under this section, have regard to any guidance given to them for the purpose by the Secretary of State. And I noted, and apologies for this, 
that the working together guidance, the statutory guidance that underpins the child protection process and procedures in England and Wales is not in your bundle. But that sets out very clearly the duties imposed. Well, I've seen it before, and Thank you. my colleagues will know it. They will know it well. So I'll, I then take you to, if I may, our annex in the main bundle at page 212 of the electronic bundle in the core bundle. to investigate and provide services, will they fall within section 17 and section 47 of the Children Act? I am not taking you, nor am I lending too much weight to section 17, but section 47, the duty to investigate, is important because significantly, and I'm moving to the bottom of 214, arising from section 47, where it is assessed that children are in need of immediate protection and removal is required this action must be taken by the police or the local authority as soon as possible. And then it links to <coughs> the sections under which that protection can be enacted. And we say that, that going back to the head note on Z, that those are the reasonable and effective systems in place to engage and ensure that Article 3 is met. In this case, and for all children who are children of diplomats and therefore also have immunity arising from their link to their parents, we say are exempt and excluded from those processes I've just taken you through. And if we may just look very quickly at the judgment. So it is paragraph 8, electronic bundle 33. My apologies for rattling through it. I'm, I'm trying to get through this in short time because I know Mr. Webster needs at least 20 to 25 minutes. So we may press this slightly over the 3 o'clock guillotine with permission. Sorry. Thank you. Where the judgment? Paragraph 8, page 33. Having just looked at the duties and the systems in place, it was held and agreed as fact that what the local authority couldn't do was to speak to the children at school or home. Couldn't speak to the school for safeguarding information. So even if the school had safeguarding concerns, couldn't have a conversation. And of course, that is the lowest level of investigation under the duties imposed under section 11, section 47. I thought they did eventually speak to them. There were at different points in time that the parents did speak to them. But for example, the parents went away for two weeks back to the sending state in February. And they permitted the local authority to speak to the children then, but not to go to the home to speak to them, nor to speak to them at school. There was at one point in time, in March, I think it was March the 3rd, a written agreement that was signed that the parents would not do certain things but of course following on from that we had the evidence from the children that there was coercive behaviour happening in the homes towards them. So, so insofar as any written agreement was signed or documented, first of all there is a question mark as to whether or not because of the privileges under the DPA they could, the parents could actually have consented to any of that, but also they didn't do that which they said they wouldn't do in any event. And there was nothing that the local authority could do about it. 
Well, are you saying that um, the reference to in, in the convention, section 31 of the convention to civil and administrative jurisdiction includes these provisions the uh, prevented the local authority from speaking to the children at school or prevented the school from passing on information? That is a, that is a, a moot point, my lord. On the one hand... It's not a point being taken by the Secretary of State, no. I think. In fact, I think the Secretary of State, his position is that nothing done by your local authority was out with, was prevented by the um, Convention and the 1964 Act. But my Lord knows that without the consent of the parents for a local authority to go and talk to a child in school, that is difficulties. And consent wasn't given. There was no active engagement in that. So on the lowest level, there, were, there was no ability to go in and speak to the children. We know that in this case, the children circumnavigated some of the issues because they were, in a clandestine way, contacting the local authority. But that's a different point. I mean, I'm not sure that the precise facts really help us decide the very fundamental legal question. But maybe I'm wrong. Well, no, but I'm hoping I'm establishing what cannot be achieved and how the state cannot give effect to even the most basic principles under Article 3. No, I mean, it, it, you're handicapped. Absolutely. Uh, and my Lord, uh, finally on this point, at paragraph 11, page 39 of the judgment, you will see what also the police were not able to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I mean, I, this may not be relevant to the case, but I'm not sure I, for my part, accept the, the line you're, you're pursuing there, Ms. Markham. Are you saying, for example, if the school had safeguarding concerns, it would not have been allowed to pass them on to the local authority? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the parent did not, parents did not at one stage consent to that, but of course the school did. But the degree to which the local authority can do anything with it, having been provided that information, is the question. Because they certainly couldn't go into the home and speak to the children. They could not do that. I mean, you know, for my part, I completely understand that the local authority is severely handicapped by the position that prevails according to the Secretary of State. And, and precisely how doesn't seem to me to make a difference to the underlying legal question. But I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. Well, my Lord, I'm attempting just in this short form way to articulate and illustrate that there are no effective systems in place. Well, there are things that can be done, as the Divisional Court held, and, and nobody disagrees with the facts that they found. And um, you say they were wrong to say that was effective in any sense. Yes. And um, the Secretary of State, I think, supports that part of the judgment, and we've had a debate with it about Ms. Gallagher. With, well, about it with Ms. Gallagher. And my Lord, the final <coughs> point I'll make on that, taking the hint to move on. Well, um, I mean, it's, it is, it's not is a that, hint, it's just that I'm not sure it, it goes anywhere. Well, my Lord, is that we say, worse than it didn't assist, it made matters worse. Right. because there were no effective systems in place to then protect the children. No. The children having blown the whistle, so to speak, it being clear what was going on. It was very bad for them. It was extraordinarily bad, and nothing could be done, and therefore matters were made worse. And we must remember the timeline. 21st of January, the EPO <coughs> application made. 18th of April, the family leave the jurisdiction. And so there is a period of time when nothing is done and the children are seeking and asking for protection from the state and nothing can be done. I mean, ju just help me with the timeline. I mean, yes. and this may not be relevant, but they left um, very early into lockdown. I mean, lockdown, this is all in 2020, isn't it? Yes. And so the, this all occurs in February, March. Lockdown occurs on, say, the 20th of March. And they've left by the end of April. Yes, but it started earlier than that. No, I know it started yes. earlier, but I mean, I was bemused as to how they managed to get a flight in the end of April when I thought we were all locked well, up. I think that was one of the issues. <coughs> that was why there had to be some delay. Right, but I mean, it wasn't much of a delay. I would have expected it to be more. But my, my Lord is right to pick up on that time. There were issues, I would recall, at the time. Yeah. And that's why I think Mr Justice Mostyn 
said what would be a reasonable time, yeah. bearing in mind what was happening globally at that point in time. Yeah. Okay. My Lord, picking up on one final, uh, on one comment at paragraph 52 of the skeleton argument of the Secretary of State uh, at electronic number 148. last sentence of paragraph 52. It is asserted that AG's younger siblings returned to the sending state with their parents and were then subject to the protect protective regime in place in that state. Now I don't know if it is being asserted that it is known as a matter of fact that they were then subject to the protective re regime or that they would have been in effect. In effect. But my lord, what we There's do... There's no evidence. No. And what we do know is that the children remained in the care of their parents. And we know that because the local authority actually remained in touch with them because of arrangements for contact and communication between AG and her siblings. And I'm going to pick up on that because what we say the Secretary of State is wrong in suggesting is that you can proceed on the basis that the sending state will exercise jurisdiction in regard to what has happened in England, even if the English court cannot. Not only would you that can only not... surely proceed on the basis that they might. Well, if there is a regime in place, as long as I don't think we have any evidence. So well, if there were you such know, protective regime as may have as been may have been in, in place, place. Or yes. may be in place. I mean, we say but it wouldn't be an answer in any event to the duties that we have under Article Three, because. It's not acting prospectively to protect. It's acting after the event. Uh, and also, in anal an an analysing the VCDR, it doesn't oblige the sending state to exercise jurisdiction. So there are no obligations at all. So we do say that the court needs to have that well in mind when it's looking at the way forward. My learned junior is going to pick up on um, a point that has already been looked at in short form in the AB case. And if I may just ask you to look to that again. Bear with me one moment. <coughs> Electronic bundle 766. In fact, I'm, no, I'm going to go on to 767 if I may. Paragraph 59. You're going to say it's 59, not 60, are you? Yes. Indeed, my lord. Yeah. <coughs> and, and I take you to this before I sit down because this is the point that my learned junior is going to pick up on and develop. And this is why we say. The Divisional Court fell into error in its analysis at paragraph 98 of its judgment. And it's paragraph 59 that we say assists the <coughs> court. It follows from these authorities that it is not the function of our domestic courts to establish new principles of convention law, but it is not to say that they are unable to develop the law in relation to convention rights beyond the limits of the Strasbourg case law. In situations which, which not yet come before the European Court, they can and should aim to anticipate where possible how the European Court might be expected to decide the case on the basis of the principles established in its case law. Indeed, that is the exercise which the High Court and the Court of Appeal undertook in the present case. The application of the Convention by our domestic courts in such circumstances will be based on the principles established by the European Court, even if some incremental development. So we say that that underpins our submissions as to why the Division Court were wrong in its approach to this case at paragraph 98. Well, look, I, I've gone through at some speed the points that I wanted to develop. I, there were other matters, but I'm acutely aware of the time, and I want to give Mr Webster the time that he needs to develop what we think is the crucial analysis flowing from that submission I've just made. Well, you come back in reply, can't you? Well, we weren't certain about that, but I was going to clarify that. Thank you. I can deal with Thank you. Mr Webster.
grateful. Uh, so I will deal with a couple of preliminary points first, the A and B points, then three points about the content of Article 3, before moving on really to the, the crux of my submissions, which focus on how the Strasbourg Court approaches conflicts between the obligations under Article 3 and other international law obligations. So the A and B point can be taken very swiftly, for I don't have very much to add to this mark. And the fundamental point is that this case, uh, in my submission, in essence, turns on two points. What are the obligations under Article 3? First, second, how does the Strasbourg Court approach the situation where there's a conflict between those obligations and another international norm? Now, uh, in my submission, the principles which the Strasbourg Court would seek to apply are very well established and I'll seek to make that point good. And so we are, in my submission, in a paragraph uh, 59 A and B situation, despite the novelty of the factual situation in which the question arises. Um, so the second category of submissions are uh, three brief points about the substantive content of Article 3. Um, now, the first, it may no longer be an issue, but uh, both... Um, uh, yourself, uh, the Master of the Rolls, and uh, Lord Justice Parker, um, the Baker, I beg your pardon, asked why does Article 3 um, require access to court? Um, and the answer to that is that's an integral part of providing effective protection and effective deterrence. Um, I hadn't, I have to say, understood the point to be in dispute in light of what's said at paragraph 17 of the Secretary of State's skeleton. We probably don't need to turn it up next week, but it's a James to tell us it's in dispute, shall we? Yes. Um, uh, but uh, should it be two very quick references to make good the point that integral to the Article 3 regime is the idea of being able actually to enforce um, uh, enforce the law or enforce orders. And that's O'Keefe, tab 31 of the Authorities Bundle, uh, page 1515. Paragraph 148, that speaks about the need to be, quote, backed up by enforcement machinery. And then also uh, Crown, um, uh, on behalf of LW and Sodexo, that's tab 11 of the authorities bundle, paragraph 46, which says it's not sufficient for the state simply to point to black letter provisions as fulfilling its positive obligation. There must be mechanisms that such there must be mechanisms to ensure that such provisions are effectively implemented. So that's the first point in Article 3. Uh, the second point is to develop um, an aspect of Ms. Gallagher's submissions um, about the importance of the fact that the, that the obligation in the Convention of the Rights of the Child to treat the interests of the child as um, a primary consider consideration is integral to Article 3 of the Strasbourg Convention. Now, I don't understand that to be in dispute. Um, uh, Ms. Gallagher has already referred to uh, Neulinger, uh, which for your reference is tab 27, page 1270, um, and it's paragraph 135, uh, which is page 1311. What is the practical con consequence of that, and why do we contend that it is so important? Well, if I could ask you perhaps to turn to paragraph 38.2 of our skeleton. <coughs> um, just for ease of reference, I'll take the quotation uh, from there instead of asking you to turn up the authorities. Um, but in Queen, on the application of project for registration of British citizens and Home Secretary, the Court of Appeal explained what the obligation to treat the best interests of the child <coughs> as a primary consideration actually means. And it means that no other consideration is inherently more significant than the best interests of the child. The question to be addressed, if the best interests point to one conclusion, is whether the force of other considerations outweigh it. So that is integral um, as a result of the Strasbourg Court's process of reading the Convention in keeping with the uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Well, that, I'm sorry, I just missed yes. where you were quoting from there. I'm sorry, I was quoting from uh, directly from paragraph 
of our standard. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and that is in turn a quotation from the English Court of Appeal in Project for Registration of British Citizens and Home Secretary. Thank you. Uh, why this is so significant in our respectful submission is that that obligation is an integral part, according to the Strasbourg Court's analysis, of Article 3. And to apply immunity is simply inconsistent with it. Because the very point of immunity is that it trumps everything else. So when immunity is in play, uh, one can't ask the question, well, are the best interests of the child outweighed by some other consideration? The answer is just uh, the parents and the child have immunity from jurisdiction. So that's the significance in our submission of uh, the best interests of the child principle being an integral part of Article 3 of the ECHR. Um, and I would just pause to note that one of the issues with the approach taken by the Divisional Court is that um, in its analysis of what Article 3 requires, it doesn't consider the UNCRC. Its analysis uh, stops, as we've seen, it reaches its conclusion at paragraph 98, and it only moves on to consider the impact of the UNCRC later in the judgment. Turning then to what um, you, Lord Foss, identified as really the crux of the point, um, if Article 3 uh, requires only um, activity to the greatest extent reasonably practicable, why is it not just an answer to point to uh, the VCDR? Well, um, there are a number of submissions in response to this, my submission. The first is that one has to approach this from the Strasbourg Court's perspective, because one here is, one's not sitting back neutrally trying to say in the position of the UK, uh, should we comply with the Convention or should we comply with the VCDR? You're looking at this through the perspective of the Strasbourg Court. And the Strasbourg Court views its aim as being to give practical and effective protection of human rights. That's, part, that's point one, um, and that's obviously a very obvious proposition, but if one needs support for it, one can get it in Al Jalini at paragraph 145, which is page 1685 of the bundle. Um, second point is that Article 3 has a particular status within the uh, Strasbourg Convention system and perhaps the easiest uh, reference to give you for that is the Suring judgment, which is quoted at paragraph 47 of our skeleton. It's an absolute prohibition on torture, inhuman or degrading uh, treatment. And it's one of the fundamental values of democratic societies making up the Council of Europe. That's the second point, particular importance from the Strasbourg Court's <coughs> perspective of Article 3. Um, third point, um, and one gets this from part of the quotation also from Suring in paragraph 48 of our skeleton, is that the Strasbourg Court doesn't view the obligations in Article 3 as simply being a regional uh, concern, as um, the Divisional Court found. Instead, it's said that they are generally recognised as an internationally accepted standard. Fourth point, when one's asking how the Strasbourg Court would actually go about this exercise, is um, the particular importance of Article 3 for protecting children. Um, and again, I won't ask you to turn it up, um, the case that is, but a particularly useful um, emphasis of that uh, is the DMD in Romania case, in, which is quoted in paragraph 19.4 of our skeleton. There can be no compromise, says the Strasbourg Court, in condemning violence against children. Children's uniqueness makes it imperative that they have more, not less, protection from violence. It's clear that respect for children's dignity cannot be ensured if the domestic courts were to accept any form of justification for acts of ill treatment, including corporal punishment. 
Next point, that the Strasbourg Court would weigh in the balance uh, when asking what Article 3 requires is the best interest point, which I just made. And so then, against all of that background, and the, the basic function of the Strasbourg Court as it sees itself to provide practical and effective protection of human rights within the European public order, if I could put it like that, it then asks, um, well, is it... Um, reasonably practical or are we complying with an obligation to to the greatest extent reasonably practicable uh, provide effective protection if we um, simply uh, point to a competing obligation under international law i.e. the VCDR and in my submission when one looks at it through those prisms through that prism the Strasbourg court is very unlikely my submission one could be confident that it would not accept the proposition that a, 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 a member state can simply point to another obligation so let's uh, say you're right. which, which completely denudes yeah, no, the Article I mean, 3 obligation of any kind. Mean, it's a powerful yeah. point, Mr. Webster. Let's say you're right. And the European Court, faced with this case, would say the, the DPA must give way. Why is that any kind of incremental change? Why is that not something completely new that has never been decided by the European Court? So however much you read down these authorities and AB and Ullo and all the cases, you actually find this is something new that had to go there for them to decide. Uh, well, I will take you, if it would help, to some of the state of unity cases. Because the impression one gets from the Secretary of State's um, skeleton argument is that the Strasbourg Court just always upholds state of unity. It doesn't. In some cases, the Strasbourg Court has been perfectly willing to say, um, and Sabe is the, um, Sabe and El Lille is the, um, right, is the best example possibly. In some cases, the Strasbourg sure Court would just say my... it's inconsistent with, even with Article 6, never mind Article 3. I mean, is that an answer to my question? My, my question is this is something that has, this is a, what, what Ms. Gallagher calls a clean slate point. And doesn't that mean that we can't decide it for all the reasons that AB explained? I'm not sure that I can go any further in response to that <laughs> question than by saying, um, although the issue has not been decided before, the principles which are being applied to guide you to the answer um, are clear. They are what Article 3 requires and how to deal with conflicts. Um, but I mean, you don't put anything in the balance about the importance of the DPA, do you? you? You just, I mean, on your side, nobody's mentioned whether it's important or not to, uh, uh, for world stability, political stability, diplomacy, the ability to actually have good relations with all other countries in the world to adhere to a treaty of this kind. I mean, the, the, I mean, I, you know, I, if I may say so, your submissions are unbelievably persuasive if you've only got one side in the balance. <laughs> but don't you have to put the other side in the balance and explain why that's not important? Well, in if I can try to respond to that, I think the answer is, can one put the other side into the balance? You say you can't. Consistently with um, all of the, the purposes behind Article 3. And we say there is here simply a, a conflict between the two. So you say, even if you put the other side in the balance, there's still a conflict? Um, yes, because the, the other side is so um, <coughs> antithetical to the values which the Strasbourg Court would seek to uphold uh, that one, one can't uh, take it properly into account. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time. The you, obvious... you say, well, just to be yeah. clear, Mr. Webster, you say <coughs> that it is so clear that Strasbourg would um, apply its previous re reasoning because of the, um, the primacy of the interests of the child, the only way in which the interests of the child can be protected that it's quite clear that 
Strasbourg would say Article 3 has precedence, and um, as you put it, um, it would be impossible for it to suggest that immunity could trump everything else. Yes, it's just, it's just flatly inconsistent with, flatly inconsistent the, with the whole of thrust of Article 3. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm very conscious that Ms. Markham said I was going to uh, take you to Alex Senni, which is a very important case, and there are at least two other cases which I think it is important that... Which case? But you've got, look, we're not... Fairclough was never intended to okay. be a hard deadline. Um, well, in that case... So it, James can talk very fast. When he's <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the court's permission, then, I'll develop um, my submissions on, the, on the, the Strasbourg Court's approach to a conflict. For, as you identified, that is ultimately the crux of the point. And so let me state perhaps the propositions at the outset and then develop them and apply them. In short, there are two key propositions of law. The first is that a state can be in breach of the Convention because it has acted pursuant to another international law obligation. Or put another way, just the other way round, the Convention can require a state to act in a way that is inconsistent with another obligation. Now, that's the first proposition, and at a general level, um, I don't understand it to be controversial, but I stress the proposition because, as uh, the court will have seen, that is fundamentally inconsistent with what the Divisional Court said in paragraph 98. There, the Divisional Court said that it's simply inconceivable <coughs> that the Strasbourg Court would require a state to breach another international law convention. And, and that is, with the utmost of respect, simply wrong. And I'll develop this in a bit more detail, but the key authority in that respect is Matthews against the UK, tab 19, page 927, electronically. Second key proposition is that the ECHR will of course try to interpret all rules of international law, including the ECHR itself, compatibly with each other, so as to try to avoid a conflict. But there are limits to that exercise. It will seek to read the Convention so as to cohere with other rules of international law, only insofar as it's possible to do so bearing in mind the Convention's status as a human rights treaty, which is to provide practical and effective uh, protection of human rights. And so to pull together three formulations from the case law, it will not engage in this harmonising process of interpretation. So it will not interpret the Convention so as to try to make it compatible with another rule of international law if, you take this from al that would impair the very essence of the Convention right, or take this from X and Latvia, if that would prevent the Strasbourg Court from performing its task in full. And then the third um, soundbite or phrase to give you is uh, from Al Dulini. And there, the Grand Chamber said that when it's looking to interpret other rules of international law, um, it will only um, it will only do so and give effect to them. If, or rather, it will ask whether the other rule of law is consonant with the Convention. Could you just give me the case? You Certainly. That, yeah. uh, so that is Al Dulini. Uh, you've got to give me all three cases. Yes. Al uh, I, I was going to develop, I was going to take you to each three of them. I was just okay. giving you the headline just points. Give me the names. The, the first is Al Adsani. Al Adsani. A D. Adsani. S A N I. Yeah. Second one. Which is tab 21, page 1036. Yeah. Second one. Second is X and Latvia. X. Okay. Yes. That's tab 30, 1438. And then the third is El Dulini. Yep. And that's tab 33, 1615. 
Yeah, so, so that's the headline submission. And in my submission, in light of that, when one turns to the situation here, uh, first, the divisional court's analysis in paragraph 98, that key paragraph, is, uh, with respect, fundamentally flawed. And second, when the correct approach is followed, the proper conclusion is that one just can't read Article 3, or rather Article 1 plus Article 3, compatibly with um, these other obligations. There just yeah. is a clash. Okay. Um, you want to take us quickly to the... Just please. take you quickly to... <coughs> is it helpful to go to 98, or do you... Of the judgment? No, we don't need to go to 98. Need to. Okay, so the three cases then... By heart. Um, I beg your pardon, four cases. Uh, for the first that I mentioned is Matthews in UK, that's tab 19, page 927. Yeah. And there are two key points to flag uh, with this. In summary, what happened here was that the UK was uh, found to be in breach of Article 3, Protocol 1 of the ECHR which is a requirement to hold free elections to the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, it was held to be in breach because it did not allow people in Gibraltar to vote in European Parliament elections. Yeah. The reason it didn't do that uh, was because uh, under the relevant EU treaties, or EC treaties, um, it couldn't. So the Strasbourg Court held that the UK is in breach of a convention requirement, the requirement to have access to um, to hold free elections, um, even although uh, the reason the UK was in breach was because it was bound by another international law rule. And uh, one particular point to flag is that um, at page 961, one can see that the government there was suggesting, it's the bottom of paragraph 26, The government is suggesting that in order to engage responsibility under the convention, it's the, it's the penultimate sentence and then the final one. The government was suggesting that in order to engage its responsibility under the convention, it needed to have, quotes, effective control over the situation. <coughs> and it said it didn't because it was actually compelled by this other international law regime to maintain the situation about... Uh, about um, about voting, and the court rejects that argument and finds that the UK was in breach. <coughs> okay, so Alad Sani, that's tab 21 of the authorities bundle, um, and this is principally a case about Article 6. Obviously, I endorse all that Ms. Gallagher said about the fundamental difference between the limited Article 6 right and the absolute and unqualified Article 3 right which we have in this uh, case. Um, but the, the primary argument is that um, when the UK upheld Kuwait's state immunity in respect of a civil claim for damages, um, the argument was that the UK acted in breach of Article 6 of the ECHR. Now, uh, the court rejected that argument, but it's important in my submission to see why. And so one picks it up at paragraph 52, which is page 1051. And the first point that I want to flag here in 52 is that the, the right which is being invoked here is the right of access to court. Now that is an implicit right in Article 6, it's not set out expressly, it's one that the Strasbourg Court has developed. And I just stress that because obviously one of the points in the Divisional Court that so impressed the Divisional Court was that, well, the rights which are being invoked here are not expressly set out in the Convention. And therefore when one comes to ask, well, how does that right relate to another international law obligation, somehow the Strasbourg right should have less weight. That's not the analysis of the Strasbourg Court. It just, as one would expect, it says, what has our jurisprudence said Article 6 requires or Article 3 requires? 
we apply that to the situation in which we find ourselves, is that compatible with the competing international law obligation? So that's the first point I'd flag for <coughs> uh, Alan Sadi at, at 52. The second to flag is, um, it's in paragraph 53, but it's at the top of page 1052 of the bundle. Mm -hmm. So it places a lot of weight on the fact that the right of access to courts is not absolute, but is inherently subject to limitations. And so that's a key part of the Strasbourg Court's analysis, when it says that, that state immunity can be compatible with Article 6 says the right of access to court is inherently limited. Uh, the situation with Article 3 is completely different, because it's not an inherently limited right, it's an absolute one. Then, at the, on page 1052, in the middle of that paragraph, you see the first requirement that the court sets down. It must be satisfied that the limitations applied, i.e. that's the limitations being applied to the Strasbourg right in order purportedly to comply with another international law rule, must be satisfied that the limitations do not restrict or reduce access left to the individual in such a way or to such an extent that the very essence of the right is impaired. And I do stress the language here. It doesn't say sort of destroyed or eviscerated. Just is it impaired? And in my submission is a very obvious one. But if one reads this over to Article 3, um, then the very essence of that right, which has within it the entitlement to be protected by the state against um, conduct which is a breach of Article 3, the very essence of that right is being impaired. Yeah. Um, uh, the third point, just to flag to you from, from uh, El Adsani, is in 55. Uh, and this is very well established wording. One sees it in all the cases, or mo most of the cases. So two, paragraph, two sentences from the end. The court must be mindful of the convention's special character as a human rights treaty, must also take the relevant rules of international law into account. It should be, it, the convention should, so far as possible, be interpreted in harmony with other rules of international law. And obviously, um, we emphasize so far as possible, because in our submission, not possible to interpret Article 3. Well, and the first part of that paragraph refers to the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties and how uh, that requires, when interpreting the obligations imposed by the European Convention, you have to take into account of any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. Yes. And your submission, as I understood it in answer to my Lord, was that the uh, terms of the Vienna Convention are effectively irrelevant because they're so antithetical to the um, structure, the obligations, the requirements, the aim of the European Convention. How does that fit with that? So, in my submission, it's the so far as possible wording. So, yes, one has to try to interpret the Convention compatibly with the Vienna Convention. But it's a different Vienna Convention. I mean, this is the one about interpretation of treaties. Yes. And well, it, this is not the dip diplomatic uh, privileges convention. But your point is, as far as possible, that even if it were the diplomatic privileges, you would say it's not possible. Exactly. That's Why doesn't paragraph 56 apply mutatis mutandis? Yes, it's state immunity. Yes. Why can't it be said? It just as why can't it be said that some restrictions on yeah. Article 3 must be regarded as inherent? Um, in my submission for two reasons. One, because of the point I made in paragraph 53, i.e. that one can, only, um, one can only rely on the other obligation, the other rule of international law, if the acts that you're taking do not restrict or reduce um, Etc. Etc. In such a way as the, the very essence of the right is impaired. So one only gets beyond paragraph fifty three if one is satisfied that to give effect to, in this case, the Vienna Convention on diplomatic relations 
if one is satisfied that that does not um, impair the very essence of the right. This, is, this demonstrates two things. One is that in it, under the uh, convention dealing with the interpretation of uh, competing or uh, <coughs> rules of international law, you do, it is a balancing exercise. And the other is, it wasn't the outcome in this case that the very essence of the right, i.e. access to a court, was impeded. There was no right of access because there was immunity. Um, yes, that's a point that I have to say uh, is possibly the, the answer, I think, from the Strasbourg court analysis must be that because it is an inherently limited right, the essence of the right is not impeded. Because if the Strasbourg court's analysis was that the very essence of the right had been impeded in this case, there would have been a breach. That's what paragraph 53 is saying to you. So it, it must have concluded that there was not an, an impediment to the very essence of the Article 6 right. That's the only way in which it moves on to 54, 55, 56. And in my submission, in this case, the very essence of Article 3 is impaired because it's just Article. Bluntly, Article 3 requires that the state can take coercive action, and uh, the VCDR stops that. And the other two points, the X versus Latvia and now Delaney, are really different ways of putting the same thing. Aren't they? That's exactly right. Uh, one is just that the court has to be able to perform its task in full. It's paragraph 94. Of X and Latvia and El Dulini, it's the same point. There is the What's the paragraph in El Dulini? Um, let me just find it for you. It's 139 in El Dulini. Okay, well, we can look those up yes. for ourselves. It is, though, if I may, just make two concluding observations one about X and Latvia and one about um, El Dulini. Um, both of those cases in my submission show that the ECHR's approach with its face with this type of conflict is not just to say we are faced with a competing obligation of international law um, that's an end of the analysis in both of those cases it did its very best to, um, to ensure that, um, that Article 8 rights in X and Latvia and Article 6 rights in Al Dalini were preserved. And, and the fundamental point is that in this case it can't do that. The second point of some general context about Al Dalini, I mean, the Lord is right that uh, the, the specific paragraph reference is just another way of making the same point. But the, the contextual point about Al Dalini is that Al Dulini um, in Switzerland and its uh, sister case Nada in Switzerland were in the strong, in one of the most controversial areas of international law that one might think of. So they were about whether um, complying with obligations to impose sanctions pursuant to UN Security Council resolutions um, breached the European Convention. And the Strasbourg Court response there was not simply to shy away from it and say oh there's an obligation to impose sanctions it was instead to maintain um, the convention rights protection um, so in conclusion if I may my submission the Strasbourg Court is going to, when it approaches this question, um, stand back and look at a situation in which, um, on the one hand, one is told that um, the state is unable, so it says, to protect children at risk of the most egregious types of harm. And it's told that it's unable to do that because of another international law convention. That international law obligation remains in force only because of the state's continuing consent to it. The state could try to change that international law obligation. That's what um, the majority in, in Reyes and Al-Malki 
very much hoped that the UK would do in response to exploitation of um, or human trafficking and exploitation of workers by diplomats. The state could, if it wanted to, try to change the obligations under the Vienna Convention. So from the Strasbourg Court's perspective, when one asks, well, is it reasonably, have you done all that's reasonably practicable to comply with your Article 3 obligation? And in my submission, it's not going to be good enough for the, for the UK or whichever state it is to go before the Strasbourg Court and say, we're bound by this other obligation. Because it's within that state's power to try to change it. And what one sees from Aldulimi and from NADA is that the Strasbourg Court very much encourages states to engage with um, potentially conflicting systems. And have there been around. frequent protocols under the Vienna Convention? No, uh, uh, candidly say not that I'm aware of. But that doesn't change the answer in principle, nor depart from the fact that in um, the Supreme Court in Riaz, the majority uh, very much hoped that that was what the government would do. So in light of the time, uh, those were uh, the submissions that I was planning to make, unless I can add with any further points. Thank you, Mr. Webster. That was very helpful. Um, Sir James. <coughs> My Lords, there is no uh, issue between the parties now about the following. There is no issue but that on the VCDR's proper and natural interpretation as a matter of international law, and thus on the proper and natural interpretation of the domestic primary legislation which transposes it, the 1964 Act, diplomatic immunity applies. No one now asserts that it is possible, to take that phrase from Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, to interpret the VCDR, or the 1964 Act, in any other way. And the reason for that, in a nutshell, is because all concerned now recognise that what in fact is being done is to call for an exception to be inserted into the VCDR where none exists and none can be interpreted in. That insertion would have to happen into an international treaty signed by over 190 states. Well, a protocol. A protocol. It would have to be a protocol. You'd yeah. have to amend it. Somehow one would have to get to a stage where, or a state in which 190 states agreed to the amendment and where the natural meaning of the language for the reasons explained so clearly by Lord Sumption in Reyes carries a very high premium. Well, Mr Webster says uh, the ECHR would require UK to have tried to do that. Yes, my Lord, he does. And we answer that by saying uh, that the issue before the court it is what is the content of the implicit <coughs> obligation within Article 3, which we all now accept, that, that contains some form of evaluative wording, reasonable, reasonably practicable, possible, whatever you wish. Would you, do you really object to the wording that seems to come out of the cases when you read them all, which is, I think I've forgotten it myself now. But reasonably it, practicable? Reasonably practicable. Well, I don't think I do. I'm going to come to those cases very briefly later on in the submissions but that's the essence of it. Yeah. The point for present purposes by way of introduction is that we head into those incompatibility arguments, those questions about what the limit and uh, nature of the content of the implicit Article 3 right is, with the domestic and international legal position being super clear. The only remaining questions are as to whether that clear, acknowledged and continuing position under international law, under the VCDR, in effect amounts to a violation of Article 3.
the argument, just to summarise it very briefly, and then I'll come to develop it if I may, but the argument in very brief summary has the following stages. We are here dealing with a situation in which the state is not doing the ill-treating. So the engagement of Article 3 is through the positive obligations that Strasbourg has implied, as it were, into the wording, to protect, to impose obligations on the state to protect against the actions of private individuals in certain carefully limited circumstances, which I'll come back to. You know the basic taxonomy under Osman, its uh, operational duties, systems duties, and all of that. I'm going to come back to that. But we're in that territory. We're not in the territory of the absolute uh, obligation that, the, that is imposed, as it were, negatively on the state, not itself to ill-treat. And that is significant, because the duty the positive duties of that kind on the state to protect other private individuals against the actions of other private individuals is a qualified one. It is, to use Mr Webster's phrase, inherently limited. It is to take reasonably practical, let's settle on that so we don't have to keep going through the wording, reasonably practical, to take reasonably practical With those concepts, as we will submit, conditioned by the principle frequently acknowledged <coughs> by the European Court of Human Rights that it, the interpretation and application of the rights under the Convention is heavily influenced by the international legal context. That's no more than a direct statement of what you see in Article 31 sub 3, sub C of the VCLT, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which you were just looking at in the context of al -Azani. And our submission is that Strasbourg here, as it has done in the past in relation to state immunity and in relation to diplomatic immunities, would regard the clear and express obligations, unqualified as they are, of the VCDR as key. We say, or will say, that the VCDR's clarity and well understood but limited and non applicable exceptions is critical to the analysis. So is the reciprocity, which is the foundation of how the VCDR works. But why is it not in flat contradiction of Article 3? I mean, Article 3 says you must take um, all protect. <coughs> children, <coughs> and so far as is reasonably practicable, um, it's reasonably practicable to take those steps by breaking the treaty, so you've got a conflict, as Mr Justice Mostyn apparently said. Well, my Lord, because we're not in conflict territory, I submit. We're in territory where the Strasbourg Court would regard the VCDR as being critical to the shaping of the nature of the implicit obligation under Article 3. Within the concept, if you will, of reasonably because practical. Because of Article 31. Reasonably because practical. Because of Article 31. Yes, reason. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to develop the submission, but it's not just because of Article 31. Mm. The logic of my learned friend's case is you rip up the VCDR in, in myriad respects and start again. If you have to confront the logic, they have to confront the logic of the case. It isn't just civil uh, jurisdiction immunity, Article 31, that would be in play. Uh, there would be serious questions uh, as to why on earth the logic that she espouses does not extend to include inviolability of the person and or the premises. No, I completely get that, yeah. that it rips up the, com the convention. Yes. Your, your question is, but why question is that is, reasonably practical? Well, it's reasonably... <laughs> not, not that. My question is, is it not at least arguable that the Strasbourg Court would regard the importance of Article 3 as overhauling that, at least in order to say there is a conflict. Well, my Lord, it's possible that they would do that. Yes. No, one is, no, one is, no one is arguing that there aren't arguments here. No. But my submission is that it's a great deal more likely, and that's all I need to do for the purpose of AB, which I will come to as well, 
uh, but we respectfully submit that it's clear from the case law uh, that what they would actually do is not to say, uh, well, it's reasonably practicable in, in the sense that you can do it because you can simply ignore all the other international obligations which are the foundation and cornerstone of international relations. But they would actually say, as they have done in al Adzani, this is an implied right, it comes with the qualified language, however you choose to put it, and that qualified language covers the VCDR and all its obligations. And it does so, not least, because the VCDR is customary and reflects customary international law, so it's at the pinnacle, or close to the pinnacle of the hierarchy of international law, and because it is the foundation and cornerstone on which international relations with all the risks to life and limb and safety of nations and all the rest of it that would flow if that international order breaks down. And we see all of those themes running through al Adzani and lots of those other cases. So, which so I will you come to. don't seek to justify um, the first sentence of paragraph 98 of the Divisional Court's judgment? My, my, my Lord, I do. I, I do, but I say you need to read that sentence in the context of the passage of the judgment in which it sits. Uh, and it so when say, well, it's a bit unfair because it starts off in the light of that analysis, referring to the last four paragraphs, which are all about PNGs and uh, all that. So, and surely that you you are accepting what I I completely understand, Sir James. Uh, which is that the rest of paragraph 98 is where the decision is, namely that um, the ECHR does not require that in its text, and there is no jurisprudence which requires the contracting parties to breach the VCDR in order to avoid a breach to the ECHR. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that wasn't quite the point that I was making. Sorry. I, I wasn't seeking necessarily to disassociate it. I mean, I was inter, inter alia saying that. <laughs> because I say you read not merely stopping at 98, I say you then read on to include 99, 100, in particular 101 and 104 and 105. That's what I meant by the passage in which it sits. But even if, one t even if I take my Lord uh, 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 as literally accurate in the light of that analysis, That's you, very kind you, <laughs> you go back to paragraph 97 yeah. and you will see that what they are actually saying is something rather more limited mm -hmm. about remedies. And of course I will come to the nature and extent of the remedies. But I'm not in a position where I need to say, or do necessarily say, I say it was a, a, a effective in, in these cases, but of course I acknowledge that one can posit hypothetical circumstances in which there will be a deficit or a potential deficit in the protection. You don't get uh, available to you all of the domestic avenues which would otherwise be available to you if you weren't dealing with a diplomat. But that is simply a concomitant of the operation of the VCDR with all of its underpinning and all of its importance. Well, that's the key point of this case. It is. It and is. The, que the question is ultimately the very simple one which is whether or not uh, 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 Article 3 of the ECHR in this positive obligation, implicit obligation that the Strasbourg Court has discovered about systems and or operational duties, matters not terribly, uh, whether or not um, uh, that duty with its qualified language requires the United Kingdom, and we would add every other contracting state within the Council of Europe to breach the cornerstone of international relations and the provisions that guarantee that, namely the VCDR. Well, that's the question. Um, not necessarily. It's whether it is the two treaties are incompatible and it should be therefore put to Parliament to decide how to deal with it. Well, well that isn't an answer with the greatest respect. That cannot be an answer. We are here dealing with the nature and content of the obligation under Article 3. You don't get to Parliament unless there is a declaration of incompatibility, and to get to a declaration of incompatibility, you have to find that the legislation, here the 1964 Act, 
and so that is in effect the BCDR, which we know can't be interpreted out of, you have to find that that is incompatible with Article 3. Yes. You don't get to Parliament otherwise. It isn't just a question of saying it's all jolly difficult because there's a clash. Yes, yeah, so you have to show that it is reasonably practicable to break the treaty. Yes. Um, to break the 64 Act, um, which leads to a declaration of incompatibility and then puts it to Parliament. Yes, but then you put it to Parliament. Again, I don't want to get jump too far ahead in the argument, but you put it to Parliament. I mean, and, and this was it, it was suggested, as it were, on the basis that this was well above the court's pay grade and don't worry about it because Parliament will sort it out. When you make a declaration of incompatibility, you expect, and Strasbourg expects, because otherwise the whole of the HRA structure falls apart mm -hmm. from a Strasbourg perspective, that Parliament will act to sure. correct the incompatibility. How would it do that? Well, the answer to that is there may be a variety of different ways in which you could try to do that, but all of them would involve rewriting or having to rewrite the VCDR. And if that is the logic, and that's the only basis on which you could find incompatibility, then so would every other contracting state in Europe. So it's not an answer. It doesn't assist the analysis to say, let's not worry about this. You can just say it's all a bit inconsistent and clashy, or might be. Ergo, Parliament can sort it out. Parliament's freedom to move but is limited by the declaration, is limited you by your finding. You say that the court cannot cop out of deciding what is reasonably practicable by handing it over to Parliament and making a declaration of incompatibility. The court has to decide what are effectively political considerations as to reasonable practicality, forgive me, uh, as to reasonable practicability, um, and take into account the evidence of, I can't remember the Foreign Office person, Macmillan, Macmillan's, yes, Macmillan. Ms. Macmillan's evidence, to say this will cause meltdown. This will cause meltdown, and on that basis, Strasbourg, at its most simple... And so we need to take that into yeah. account. My Lord, you do. And that, that is something that is legitimate yes. for the court to consider in deciding whether to grant a declaration of incompatibility. Yes, because you have to decide the content yeah. of the implied right in Article 3. And that's so the only way you get to incompatibility and therefore to Parliament. So when I berated repeatedly, and I hope not rudely, um, each of the advocates on the other side, I think none was exempt. Um, uh, by saying you're ignoring the competing weight of non-compliance with the, the convention, um, you say that was the right question to ask. I do. Not merely do we say that was the right question to ask, we say that was the central question to ask. And it is telling, essential question. It, it is telling that you've had no answer to it. I don't mind, I'm not going to debate the adjective, but no, it's a critical question for reasons we've not been had, discussing. I certainly didn't have a comprehensive treatment of it because each of the advocates <coughs> told me uh, that it didn't matter because the Article 3 was an absolute right and the ECHR would decide uh, that it was absolutely um, uh, it, it, uh, it there was no justification for breaking it. Well, that's why I started with the nature of the Article 3 right that you're actually dealing with, yeah. the headline one and the breakdown, the taxonomy within Article 3 as we now know which is that the the thing that is absolute is the state shall not itself torture or ill treat. Yes, well, I understand that. All of that. But I mean, this is um, yes. a very simple case then. It is. Yes. We submit, and, and it's central to the judgment of the divisional court below, as you've seen. 98 is one paragraph, 105 is another. It's developed throughout the judgment. This was the thing that really caused them concern, and for very good reason, we submit. Well, that's it. That, that, I hope that's not a. Um, too short an introduction, but that's the basic structure of the argument that we'll be developing, and it may have got more simple or less simple. Well, what, what I find, um, I, I won't use an adjective because it will then get me into trouble, what I find difficult, shall we say, is that there are a hundred cases that all say the same thing, yeah. and there seems to be complete common ground as to what they say, in effect. The, the only thing you're disagreeing about is what conclusions can you draw from those myriad of cases as to what the ECHR might decide. Um, I don't think there's any real dispute. Um, I mean, there is a, perhaps a little dispute <coughs> we'll have to deal with about what AB means in the light of the, what should we say, change of personnel. 
Um, <laughs> You're not allowed to say that. I've just said you it. Just said <laughs> it. Um, but I mean, because the, the cases are not entirely easy to lay end to end, so we need to be helped with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, but um, because that helps us to know what we in these domestic courts are allowed to do in relation to what to, to look at what Strasbourg is going to say. Uh, but those are the two areas of most important uh, examination. Really. Yes, I'm going to look at the Strasbourg cases when I, when I get there, and I'm also going to confront what I uh, uh, um, anticipate remains, although it's been fairly lightly treated, uh, um, what remains uh, the arguments that are being mounted on the basis of other species of international law that they say Strasbourg would take into account in the same breath as looking at the VCDR, and at least at yes, some you have in to the deal with the case UNCAS and UNCRC and all of that. I'm going to come to that. Well, you have to deal with the sanctions case. Yes, but that, this, that's the territory I'm on. That's where I'm going to go. So, okay. if that's convenient. Very helpful, thank you. Um, I was going to start very briefly with the nature and effect of the VCDR, and. First of all, therefore, with its nature, its nature, and so far as that is concerned, uh, uh, eight short points. One, it codifies what has been described as one of the oldest principles of customary international law, and I'm sure my laws don't need me to introduce customary international law to you. Law that's accepted by a very broad range of states. You've got to show state practice. And you've got to show opinion of Euros, in other words, they're following it as a matter of obligation rather than discretion. Uh, that is the description that was given to it by Lord Sumption at paragraph 5 of Reyes, cited in paragraph 46 of the judgment. Now, now you namely, say about Lord Sumption that uh, all he said about the principles of customary international law were common ground with the other. Common ground with my other members of the court and basic and obviously correct principles and a very helpful summary and have been so treated in numerous cases since, including the Anne Sekula's case George, which we referred to in our skeleton but uh, frequently cited. Uh, Lord Wilson and Lady Hale disagreed on the application of those principles in the particular context they were dealing with, but there was certainly no error of understanding as to the nature of those principles by the divisional court below, uh, see in particular judgment paragraph 48 where they referred to the majority and the minority view and so on. So they were well alive to how the case panned out on its uh, facts and what Lord Sumption was doing. We respectfully submit he was correct in all the passages cited by the court below. Uh, some confirmation, uh, limited perhaps because of the crispness of the summary given by um, uh, uh, Lord, Lord Leggett in the Basfar and Wong case, but can I just invite you to note also, I'm not going to turn it up, uh, the Wong case at tab 16, paragraphs 16 to 18, again chiming with, with Lord Sumption. So one of the oldest principles of customary international law is what Lord Sumption described uh, 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 as the immunity accorded to diplomatic agents. So it was customary international law even before they signed up to it, <laughs> is, the, is the critical point there. Secondly, it is a cornerstone of international relations. It has, in the ICJ's words, in the Tehran case, which we've given you in our skeleton at paragraph 5, so you, it's not in the bundles, you don't need it, but it has, as the ICJ put it in that case, quote, withstood the test of centuries and proved to be an instrument essential for effective cooperation in the international community. And obviously, a breakdown of that system carries with it the most serious of risks, for obvious reasons. The cornerstone of the modern international legal order is a phrase from uh, Denza, cited by Lord Sumption in Reyes at paragraph 6. See again the judgment of paragraph, below at paragraph 46. And as Miss Macmillan put it in paragraph 6 of her witness statement, and if you want it, it's by tab 15 on page 90 of the supplemental bundle, she, as she put it, the vital role that the VCDR plays on a day-to-day -day basis in facilitating the peaceful and enduring conduct of international affairs. And so the privileges and immunities that it affords are thus recognised as being not merely important but essential to the proper conduct of uh, international relations 
that are, for obvious reasons, themselves vital for securing all of the benefits, peace and security, to name but a couple, that flow from the effective performance of international relations. If unwanted evidence to underscore the practical reasons for the privileges and immunities that are afforded under that system, again, see Ms. Macmillan, this time at paragraph 7, as she put it, those immunities and privileges allow diplomatic staff to carry out their essential work without fear of reprisal, no matter how unpopular their mission, no matter how difficult the conditions in the receiving state. From the FCDO's perspective, this protection is one of the most valuable elements of the VCDR in practice, and one that is rigorously upheld by the UK, even in times of crisis. That's paragraph 7. So it's little surprise then, it might be thought, uh, given that unanimity of view, that the preamble to the codifying treaty itself, the VCDR, should acknowledge that core purpose of the privileges and immunities that it deals with. For the preamble itself, see the judgment below at paragraph 37. So cornerstone of international relations is the second point. Third point its privileges and immunities operate to protect those to whom they attach for those reasons against accusations of the most serious conduct. The base theory of the VCDR is that the usual jurisdictional territorial writ does not run against this category of person, however bad the alleged conduct and it does not do so because of the greater goods that flow from effective diplomatic relations and their protection. And the result is to protect, it in fact operates to protect, against what Lord Sumption described as a conduct that may be truly wicked. Paragraph 7 of Reyes, quoted in the judgment below, paragraph 46. So it would, for example, protect the diplomat from the jurisdiction of the local courts, even if the evidence suggested the murder of a child. But that is integral to the scheme, and for that reason, it is a key principle that the judge or a domestic judge, again, <coughs> Lord Sumption, paragraph 7, quote, cannot allow his regret to whittle away an immunity sanctioned by a fundamental principle of national and international law. That leads naturally to another core underpinning of the VCDR, and this is the fourth point. It operates reciprocally. And the importance of that feature is obvious at many levels. To take but one example, diplomats' roles are being fulfilled in many states and may be at their most useful and important in states where trust is not so clearly established and where conventional values that are taken for granted, say, in the United Kingdom, are not so clearly respected or adhered to. The rules operate to protect, for example, our diplomats and their families, including their children, in such states against allegations that may be ill-motivated. And that protection is uh, vital. They operate to protect the UK diplomat in such a country alleged, for example, on the basis of evidence that we would not find convincing or that might not even pass the trumped up or not state test. I mean, Sir James, I stopped uh, Miss Gallagher from going on about her side of this uh, uh, forensic argument. Uh, we completely understand the points that you're making, so you, you don't need to... Um, Embellish. Them. I won't. Paragraph 7 of Macmillan, then, yes. is this fourth, <laughs> is this fourth point, but it is, it is critical. <laughs> because if we change it, if we ignore it, then the consequence is redundant. I mean, you're, what you're saying is critical, and what Miss Gallagher said about the interests of the children is also critical. We, unfortunately, have to decide who's right as a matter of law, but we don't doubt that what you're saying as to the importance of the treaty or the importance of uh, the children's welfare is uh, extremely significant. And uh, you know, I just want to make that clear. I'm grateful. My Lord, I won't develop the fourth point, reciprocity. You have it. Yes. The fifth point is that the UK is bound by it. Yeah. And so are all other contracting states to the ECHR. So if the courts here 
were to start applying their jurisdiction in the face of the immunity conferred by the BCDR, the effect would be to place the UK in breach on the international plane, as the Divisional Court found. Right, I think you also would say that it's, um, if we put a hole in it, then it's, uh, there's a hole in it throughout Europe, at there the very is. least. There is. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it would not merely be a breach of the treaty, it would be a breach of customary international law, which that treaty reflects. Mm. And, and of course that leads to the adjunct point, which is that the UK can't unilaterally change the rules, nor can the contracting states in Europe. Has there never <laughs> been a protocol to the treaty? Well, I'm not aware of one, um, but there would certainly need to be that or something like that. But we can't do that on our own. Can you find out, David? I will. I'll make, make sure we've got an absolute answer. And again, that chimes, that inability to do things without the consensus of all 190, as it were, chimes with the reciprocity point. Because if we take a, a particular position or we try and do things unilaterally, then that risks the reciprocity and the reprisals and all of that. I won't develop that. Sixth point, the VCDR does itself provide for steps to be taken in the event of conduct considered to be unacceptable by the sending states' diplomats, including invitations to the sending state to waive, on the well-known basis that these immunities <coughs> and privileges exist for the benefit of the sending state and not the individual, quite an important principle. So there's a waiver uh, point there, um, uh, and that's not the diplomat's decision, as it were, that's the state's decision, which is a, 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 an essential part of the safeguarding process. And uh, you've seen some of the other steps which I will come back to when I'm dealing with remedies as part PNG of the PNG and so on. Exactly. But, but I suppose you say, do you, that uh, that is the explanation, uh, the first sentence in paragraph 98? In part, although that's why I kept saying go back to the previous paragraphs, because 97 is not, when you read the first sentence of 98 with 97, the divisional court uh, do not appear to be saying that will always be that will always lead you to no deficit. What no, it doesn't what, say that at all. What they're saying is that various steps were taken, they happen to apply here, there may well be a deficit, but if there is a deficit, that's because of the VCDR, that's the limit. So perhaps the bigger point is that the VCDR itself it does. provides the remedy. And you've seen, you saw it, I'm going to refer back to it when I get to remedies in my submissions a bit later, but you, you saw, because I um, drew it to your attention from my learned friend, Miss Gallagher, of pause, I think it was page 52, the section 4 certificate mm. that was provided to the court. But the significance of that certificate was not that it was provided to the court for present purposes. It, it was that it recorded the correspondence that had occurred between the Foreign Office or the Foreign Secretary and the sending state. And that correspondence outlined with some specificity the nature of the allegations and of the concerns. So there are a variety of steps that can be taken. That was in, uh, as part of the request that was made to the sending state to waive. You don't, you don't deny that um, taking proceedings under the various sections of the Children Act would be more effective to protect the children's welfare at the point of difficulty? I, I don't deny that it could be more effective, uh, and I don't, don't deny, of course, the obvious advantages of having those sorts of issues determined by a court as opposed to interstate. But lots of things are sorted out into state, and that is not to say that the processes that the VCDR have provided are not highly relevant. And also, they're quite old. I mean, uh, the, the, the treaty is a long time ago, and the customary right. international law is a long time ago, so they might have been regarded as adequate 50, 60 years ago. They might not be regarded as so good today, but they're what, what they are what they are. They, they are what they are, and you'll have noted that the common feature of all of them is that they are, in effect, which may underline my Lord's point about their potential concerns about effectiveness, but they are, in effect, all consensual. Yes. They require the nation states to cooperate with each other. Well, PNG is not that consensual. It, it isn't, but it, but it's still, it, it's a, it's a, it's informing the, it's informing the other state. 
that the person they have sent over is not a person who is welcome. Well, the receiving state has always it's always been open to the receiving state to close the mission. Yeah, it has, and to invite the other side, the other state to waive and to do all of those other things. Yeah. So we respectfully submit that they are important, and they are the most important point about all of this is that they are the mechanisms that have inured and continue to be provided. They are the mechanisms set up under the bespoke treaty. You see them operating. Yeah. They operate every day and they can operate. I just should emphasize, if in principle, if one stands back from it, they can operate uh, very swiftly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are obvious problems with COVID here, although the plane left pretty quickly thereafter. I think it was the 18th of April, but, uh, but they, they could operate very, very quickly. I mean, there could be an email sent on, on at five o'clock on one evening saying this particular individual we regard as presenting a very serious and immediate risk. And uh, you need to deal with that very quickly, and we invite you to do so. If you're not prepared to waive, that would no doubt be the first port of call. Kindly waive so our systems can operate. Uh, and if it was a, uh, an emergency case of real seriousness, one would expect uh, the foreign state to react accordingly. But even if they didn't, the next stage could be gone through very quickly. But we are going to remove them very fast, and you need to remove them very fast, so that your jurisdiction can pick up the problem, because that's the way the VCDR is designed to work. Anyway, the point for, for, for the nature of the VCDR is that it contains its remedial mechanisms. The seventh point is that there is evident and fundamental benefit in the VCDR operating on the basis of clear, long-established and well-understood rules. history of the codified rules assists that clarity for obvious reasons, that's the point Mr Macmillan makes in <coughs> eight, and considerable care and negotiation preceded on the international level, perhaps unsurprisingly given the 190 states signed up, considerable care and negotiation preceded their formulation. Well and they apply to states of all types. And they do, exactly so. By states of all types. Yeah. I said there were seven or eight points, but the eighth point is probably a corollary of the seventh, which is that the risks of moving from that position are clear and evidenced. See, for that purpose, in particular, Ms. Macmillan's evidence at paragraph 13, risk to diplomat safety, 15.1, possibly politically motivated charges in uh, other countries, 15.2, uh, uh, floodgates risk, 18, risk of confusion in understanding the content of the rules, which is, she describes as very problematic from an, op from an operational perspective. So that's the seven and a half or eight point risks of moving from that clear and evidenced. What then is the effect? I said I was going to deal with the nature and effect of the VCDR. What then of the effect of the VCDR? We're dealing here with diplomatic agents they enjoy, as you've seen from the judgment below, inviolability of the person, Article 29, and we've given you, I should say, because I'm going to refer to various uh, provisions of um, the, the treaties, we've given you, uh, uh, this is on the VCDR, but just so I remember it, we've given you the, the full text of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties behind tab 62 in the supplemental bundle. You only had extracts before, it may be more convenient to have the bits all in one place, but it's tab 62 if you need it. But anyway, the VCDR, diplomatic agents, inviolability of the person, Article 29, inviolability of property slash residence, Article 30, sub 1. This is all behind tab 43, page 2178 and following. And immunity from jurisdiction, Article 31. There are four features that you need to note about the Article 31 immunity, just to focus on that. It also applies to the family forming part of the household, Article 37.1. 37 it applies to criminal, civil and administrative jurisdiction of the receiving state, and civil jurisdiction extends to family law proceedings, as I think is common ground, we've given you the references in paragraph 11.3 of the skeleton. It contains, that's the VCDR 
uh, contains express limited exceptions. And the fact that it does so is significant, especially bearing in mind Lord Sumption's points about clarity and the limited scope, uh, as it were, implying things into a convention of this kind. The parties have actually turned their mind to the point and made the decisions they've made about the limits and nature of those exceptions. Final thing to note, and the fourth thing to note about the Article 31 immunity, it's an immunity not from liability, but it is a procedural immunity from the jurisdiction of the receiving state. So under the international law system, the determination of the allegation and its consequences remain open, as it were, but they are for the sending state. That's a point clearly made in the first half of paragraph 7 of Reyes' judgment below paragraph 46. See also, in that respect, Article 31.4 of the VCBR, which makes clear that the immunity provides no exemption from the jurisdiction of the sending state. So far as remedies are concerned, just to give you the articles, self-contained remedial scheme, and we submit it's not for the local courts to reinvent that wheel, as it were, but waiver is Article 32, expel with or without reason, and persona non grata, Article 9, and there are various other ways of expressing displeasure more broadly, of the receiving state express, expressing its displeasure more broadly, cap on the number in the mission, Article 11.1, and ultimately severing relations and or closing the mission. That's all I want to say about the VCDR, which forms a backdrop to the submissions that then come. And just before coming to the straight incompatibility issues, I wanted to deal with, make two or three points in relation, if I may, to the, uh, I wanted to make a couple of points in relation to the interpretation slash approach. So, the VCDR sitting alongside the ECHR, sitting alongside the other international conventions, two or three points in relation to that. The basic position in Strasbourg, of course, is that the rights in the ECHR are not to be interpreted as they put it in a vacuum, but by reference to international law of which the ECHR forms a part. That's the well-known principle in Demir in Turkey and Neulinger in Austria. And you have the principle and the references in our skeleton of paragraph 13. The principle, and again to take the language often used in the mantra that is always wheeled out by the ECHR, the European Court for this purpose, the principle is one of, quote, harmonious interpretation, insofar as the relevant rules of international law are concerned. And that is a direct reflection of the requirement that is set out, or the canon of interpretation that is set out, for the interpretation of treaties in the VCLT, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 31, sub 3, sub c, behind tab 62. And I wanted to uh, make three points about the arguments that are now being advanced against us. The first one is that the case that is now being made is not one of harmonious interpretation as between the VCDR and the ECHR at all. On the contrary, the invitation to, from the appellant side and the local authority side, is to invite the court to override or ignore or require the UK to breach the VCDR. No one is suggesting that you can interpret the VCDR so as to permit local courts to exercise jurisdiction over diplomats and their children, where you've got concerns about ill treatment. That wouldn't be so on a rarest natural interpretation. It wouldn't even be so. And what sort of interpretation? The, a, a natural interpretation. Oh, a natural. Okay. I, I only put that first because you saw the... I thought there was a bit of Latin in there. No, natural. Rares. Rares. Case. Yeah, rares yes, the case, sorry. No, not rares. Not rares. <laughs> not Latin. <laughs> Not oh, Reyes, Reyes. <laughs> that wouldn't be so on a natural Reyes interpretation. Perhaps I would call it Reese, it's probably easier. Natural Reese interpretation. But nor would it be so even if we could use the art of the possible under Section 3 of the HRA, as, as everyone agrees. So harmonious interpretation of Article 3, as is suggested, 
involves overriding the BCDR, even though it is CIL, and doing so on the basis of preferred provisions, in particular, of other parts of international law, the UNCRC, UNCAT, and so on. That's the United Nations Convention Against Torture. That is, in truth, an argument not about harmonious interpretation, but an argument that asserts precedence, in effect, of Article 3 over the VCDR. And that, if I may respectfully say so, once one recognises that, that this is an argument about overriding or effectively cutting out bits of the, VC, uh, bits of the VCDR, that cuts across the clear distinction drawn in the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties between rules of interpretation on the one hand and rules that allow for some parts of treaties to be rendered unenforceable or void. I mean, something that has occurred to me, Sir James, that you might want to think about overnight is I, I, I find it difficult to see <coughs> how the court, of, the court is equipped to balance the weight of two obviously very important um, principles of international law. Um, first, Article 3, which you know, everybody accepts is an absolutely fundamental principle against torture and ill treatment of the person and children in particular. And secondly, the very, very important um, uh, treaty on diplomatic privileges. Now, I mean, you have been, if I may say so, eloquent in uh, telling us how terribly important the latter one is, and Miss Gallagher was very elegant in her turn about telling us how important the former was. How do we balance under the pretext of considering what is reasonably practicable, which is not really a natural tool for such an exercise, how does the court approach it? Or does it just say, well, there are two principles of customary international law, one must uh, give way, and the one that is evaluative has to give way because the other is absolute in every sense, whereas I think even Miss Gallagher in her um, most moments would accept that there is an evaluative part of Article 3. She said that. So, so you say, well, the evaluative bit must give way, it can give way, and so it must give way. And that's the end of it. There is no inconsistency. But I, I feel uncomfortable about the court weighing up two incredibly important principles in that way. My Lord, I'm not sure there's any escape from that. I mean, you have heard me in the past on occasion tell you that these things were, were for government to weigh. Yeah. And this was margin of appreciation or discretion territory. I'm not, not saying that to no. you now. No. You, 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 just like Strasbourg, would have to grapple with it, and you have to do so using whatever tools you have to hand, which are the indications from the case law, a correct appreciation of the standing of the VCDR as we submit, a correct understanding of where, truly within the scheme of all of this, the UNCRC obligations that exist on the international plane and in UNCAT exist on the international plane, where they fit into the analysis. And you ultimately have to make a judgment because that's what you're required to do by the Human Rights Act. You have to make a judgment about the nature and content of the Article 3 right. And the significance of the evaluative bit is not that it, as it were, has to give way because it's evaluative. The point is, maybe put it the same point in a slightly different way, but nevertheless I do it. It, 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 it is, we submit the significance of that language and that now acceptance that it's, there's an evaluative bit in Article 3 is that it does allow you with full force, as it were, to take into account the principle which you're already enjoined to take into account by the BCLT, which is to get to a place where all of the international provisions can work together for the purpose of deciding the content. But I am not, however reluctantly, because it's a lovely natural port of call for me, I am not saying to you, margin of appreciation can solve this problem, I'm afraid. Obviously it can't. But yeah. it's, it's, it's harmonious. The point I was on about recognising the nature of the case that's being made, not a question of interpretation, but on their case, a, an overriding of the provisions of the VCDR, <coughs> irrespective of whether they might be amended in the future, 
we would have to breach, so would the convention states, the ECHR states, and so on, if their conception of what Article 3 requires is right. And the difficulty with that is it does move one miles away from interpretation. What, what it does is to take one into territory where what they're actually saying is treat those provisions of the VCDR, brackets, don't bang down the door of the embassy, don't arrest the diplomat, do exercise the Children Act civil jurisdiction. That's all overriding or ignoring in a particular context. And there are specific provisions in the VCLT, in other words, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, drawing a distinction between those rules that govern true interpretation, e.g. Article 31.3.C, harmony with international law, as compared to the voiding provisions in relation to which you'd need to establish that there is a principle of jus cogens right at the very top, torture, I'm going to come back to it, um, and then there is a specific process in the VCLT. So the, the grounds on which you can void a treaty obligation are dealt with in particular in Articles 53 and 54 of the VCLT. I don't know if I should turn them up now, but there's a specific process that enables that sort of argument to be run, I think, in front of the ICJ. And that and voids the whole treaty. That voids the whole treaty. My Lord, my Lord is right. And it, and it also can only be exercised and brought to bear by one of the parties to the treaty. It can't be... It's not, it's not something that private individuals can interfere with. So one needs to be very careful because there are international law consequences that flow from that distinction between voiding provisions and interpretation. That's the first, first point. And of course, as I emphasized earlier, if my learned friends are right about the content of the Article 3 obligation, the problem, of course, lies not in any shape or form, as is sometimes the case, in the domestic transposition of the international obligations. The problem here lies directly, because it's word for word transposed, in the provisions of the VCDR itself, with all of the consequences that flow from that. And so that, no doubt, is in part why the Divisional Court was so troubled by this point and why it sits so close to the heart of their reasoning. Uh, second point I wanted to make, it, it is very important, I respectfully submit, perhaps if I just do these three, if I may, and then that, that may be a convenient moment, but the second point I wanted to make is that it's very important, we submit, for there to be precision of analysis in terms of the thing that is said by the other side to be either customary international law itself, so as it were to be of equal weight to the VCDR, or Jus Kogens, peremptory norms of international law, at the high, highest end of the tree. Uh, and there are two aspects to that to be uh, highlighted. The first of them is that there are, there are rules that govern when something is properly to be characterised as CIO and when something is to be characterised as Jus Kogens. For the requirements before a, a norm of international law can properly be called customary international law, see our skeleton at paragraph 23. Almost uniform state practice and opinio juris. It doesn't just mean the opinion of lawyers, it means following it as a matter of obligation. For Jus Kogens, see Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties, behind tab 62, quote, a norm accepted and recognised by the international community of states as a whole, from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. And Jus Kogens is <coughs> distinct from CIL and a higher threshold because lots of international legal consequences flow from a breach of Jus Kogens. Secondly, and perhaps critically, one needs precision about the proposition which is said to be CIL or Jus Kogens. It, it isn't enough to assert, as it were, apple pie and mum assertion, to assert that torture is prohibited. Of course it is. Or to assert that torture is Jus Kogens, or the prohibition on a state torturing someone is Jus Kogens. Nor is it enough to say that the best interests of the child as a principle from UNCLC or reflected in that is, is widely recognised. It is. 
what one is dealing here with is, a, it, 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 it is something much more specific than that. And it's that thing, that proposition, that has to be CIL or Jus Kogans, satisfying the hurdles that I identified earlier, state factors, opinion, Euros, the higher test. And you say order. they're not. I you say I, the protections of the child contained in the Children Act or the obligation to take um, effective measures to protect children, so far as reasonably practical, is not Jus Kogans or CIL? Oh, my Lord, I, 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 I do say that. Yeah. And um, I, I say you've got to go through the processes if you're going to make that good. But the important thing to bear in mind for this purpose is it isn't good enough to just say torture, the prohibition on torture is just Kogan's. We're dealing here, it's a point that Baroness Hale was very alive to in a case called E and the RUC, which we'll come to tomorrow. But we're dealing here not with the negative prohibition on the state torturing people. We're dealing here with something removed from that, which is the positive obligation to protect one citizen from the actions of another citizen. And that obviously <coughs> is a very, very different thing, because that engages all sorts of um, uh, uh, different aspects of obligation. It requires a whole bunch of different considerations before you decide on the nature and content of said obligation. That's why Osman went out of its way, as the first case of this kind, to emphasise that the evaluative wording was critical to the nature of that obligation. In other words, only do what is reasonably practicable, don't impose the impossible or disproportionate burdens on the state and all of that, because it's a fundamentally different nature of thing than you, the state, shall not torture people. And you say this hasn't really been engaged. I do. But, but my point for present purposes is, is, is the very narrow one, which is that this is, you, you need precision. If you're going to say that something is CIL or Jos Kogans, you need to say what it is. Yeah. And, and you see that. We'll go to it perhaps tomorrow when we pick up Aladzani all in one go. But the one thing you see absolutely clearly from the analysis of the European Court in Aladzani, when you get to those paragraphs, is them doing precisely that. They say, no, no, it's no good just saying, you know, torture's a bad thing, because we all know that. What we're dealing with here is the question, should you be able to sue someone in the local courts for torture if they would otherwise be covered by state immunity. Including the minority? Do they address it in that way as well? Uh, the minority, I'm not sure, did quite address it in that way. But there is a, there is a perhaps more interesting than the, than the minority, although I appreciate it was 9-8, it is the, the very helpful summary of the reasoning that you see in um, Mr. Pellenpah and Sir Nicholas Bratz's concurring if you were going to read anything overnight, it would be to reread Al Alzani and to reread to re perhaps that concurring opinion, because that shows you both the nature of the analysis. You need precision, you need to identify the very thing, and then ask the question how important is this particular principle? But it also involves a point which I'm going to come back to tomorrow, particularly in the Bratz of Helen Parr opinion, although that's probably putting the authorship the wrong way around. Um, uh, uh, but you see also them <coughs> testing the logic. In other words, if they're right about this, if you can, in fact, go after these people for this thing, with all the consequences that might flow from the International Convention we're worrying about or the state immunity principle that they're worrying about there, where does that lead? And that will be of significance to us because the point has been put against me on the basis that what is needed is effective protection for children, which I quite understand. But that does raise, as a matter of logic, bashing down the door of the embassy, inviolability of the person and of the premises, and, and all of that. Um, so that's coming, that's coming tomorrow, but extremely important to have uh, precision. The third point I can make much more quickly, if I may, which is that it is important to recognise that international conventions, UNCRC, UNCAT, and it was basically the worry about UNCRC which led to this, are not incorporated into domestic law, because we're dualist, they're not incorporated into the European Convention on Human Rights, they are at most relevant 
to assist in the interpretation. Which is what Miss Geller said. It, which is what she said. But, but, but one needs to be aware, the limit, be aware the limits of that, because it's very easily, it very easily drifts the International Convention reliance, very easily drifts into something much more hard-edged by way of reliance, and that is not acceptable. That was the myth that was exploded, if that's the right way of putting it, by the Supreme Court in their, I think, I think there were nine or eleven, possibly in SC, which is one of your, one of your, one of your letters. That's behind tab fourteen. Well, SC is one I'm unfortunately very familiar with. That's six six six. So you've got all of that. But you remember there was a segment on international law. And I can remember that because it stands for Supreme Court. Yes. <laughs> well, for those, for those for those of us who have a an automatic thing on your computer. <laughs> The moment you type in SC, Supreme Court comes up, and you have to spend hours altering it. But, that's the, it but the, the difficulty with these two initials is you can never search for them. No. Because if you search for SC, you get a million, a million SCs. Cases. And you, you anyway, I've just yes. urged people to use three or four initials if you're going to do this. You can search for things. Anyway, uh, um, <laughs> Mr. Combo. James, I think that might be, we might have to that's draw convenient. stumps if that's... Um, of course, my lord, that's a very convenient moment. I'm yeah. sorry to have gone on. But. Um, we'll resume at 2pm tomorrow. Um, we're not resuming in the morning. You, I hope, knew that. I, d I didn't, I'm afraid. Right. Did everybody else? No. No? Well... Just get a call in the evening. Who? You can do the morning. I can do the morning, but I think you can't. No. Um, I'm, it was me who originally couldn't do the morning, but I can now, but my colleagues can't, so uh, we have to sit at two. Does that give anybody difficulty? Day and a half case. Um, yes. And I'm afraid it will be 2 p.m., and we'll be finishing by 4.30. Good. <laughs>